myself. Yeah. So. <laughs> good, good. So good evening, uh, everyone. I think the title of my talk uh, had to do with uh, uh, living a holy ni- life in a secular world. <clears throat> When it comes to secularism, secularism is a rejection of Christianity, if not an outright hatred of Christianity. So today, for example, uh, more and more we hear such things as uh, it's okay to uh, practice your your religion uh, as long as you keep it within the confines of your church, but uh, just don't bring it outside of the walls of your church. However, uh, regardless of what the situation is in our society, our world, as far as leading a holy life goes, eh, it's, it's the same, whether it's in the first centuries of the church, uh, you, centuries of persecution, uh, whether it's the Middle Ages, uh, whether it's the 1950s, whether it's 2016. So living a holy life uh, really doesn't, doesn't change. There could be... Uh, more obstacles, more difficulties, but even the obstacles and difficulties, or what we might consider to be obstacles and difficulties, uh, actually are stepping stones to uh, living a holier life, which is why God permits them. Uh, Scripture tells us that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. So if it seems as if today sin is more prevalent, uh, or temptation, if you will, is more prevalent, it also means that God's grace is more accessible today. God is offering us more grace than maybe at other times in history when people didn't have to face so many temptations. And of course, every time we do face a temptation and we don't give in to it, we reject it, we turn it down, that means that we, we just grew in grace, we grew in holiness, and that's, of course, what God is hoping that we'll, what we'll do. So uh, my, my talk tonight actually is based on an article by Father John McCluskey He's an Opus Dei priest. Some of you may be familiar with the name, Father John McCluskey. And the title of his article is The Seven Daily Habits of Holy Apostolic People. So you probably also heard of books, various books, uh, Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, things like that. Well, this is uh, Holy Apostolic People. What do Holy Apostolic People do? And if we want to become holy and apostolic, that's what we'll do as well. We all know, hopefully we all know, that uh, we're all called to holiness. We're all called to be saints. God wants everybody to be a saint. And the way to do that, of course, is to grow closer to our Lord. And the way to grow closer to our Lord is the same way that we grow closer to anyone else. So how do we grow close to people? Uh, we, We spend time with them. Now, we, we talk with them. And, of course, the more time that we spend with our Lord, the more time that we, we talk with him, the more we're going to love him because there's no, no one more lovable than our Lord. <clears throat> and uh, what, what is the reward for our, our efforts? Well, it, we're going to be as happy as we possibly can be in this life, and we'll be even happier in the next life. Those are the rewards. Not too bad, not too shabby. <clears throat> Father McCluskey points out that uh, these habits, which we'll get to eventually, uh, should, be, should be assumed gradually. Now, for some people, they may be doing already this and, and possibly even more, uh, but other people, it may sound like quite, quite a bit. If, if someone's a couch potato, for example, and he decides that he's going to run a, a 10K, Uh, well, he may run the danger of uh, having a heart attack. What he should do is uh, start walking around the neighborhood and then maybe he could start jogging and eventually he could build up to where he'd be able to to run that that 10K. And in the the spiritual life, kind of the same thing. Sometimes people will try to do too much too quickly and they get discouraged when they find out how difficult it may be and so they give up everything. So better to start off slow uh, rather than to try to do too much and uh, give up. However, these uh, seven daily habits have to be a commitment in our life. 
or if you will, our relationship with our Lord, because that's what these habits are all about, our, our commitment, our relationship to the Lord has to be the most important thing in our life. So more important than eating, you know, we, we like to eat, most of us like to eat anyway. Yeah? So more important than sleeping, most of us kind of like to sleep too. More important than our work, some of us are not so keen on working, but anyway. <laughs> more important than recreation, more important than our family members, our relationship with the Lord has to be the most important thing at all. <clears throat> When we, we do pass from this life to the next life, and we stand before the judgment seat of God, the only thing that we're going to bring with us is the love that we have in our hearts. How much do we love our Lord, and of course love others because of our love for him? That's the only thing that's going to be, be, be with us, if you will, is going to stand us in good stead at that particular moment. <clears throat> By living these habits, <clears throat> not only will you not lose time, but you'll actually gain time. <clears throat> so the busier you are, and that's the, probably the, the main excuse that people use for not exercising themselves more in a spiritual way. I, I'm just too busy. You know, maybe when the kids are grown, when I'm retired, I'll have more time. Uh, no, no. The busier you are, the more you need to take that time to be with the Lord. A certain bishop was uh, meeting with the priests of his diocese, <clears throat> and he was encouraging them to spend an extra half hour a day in prayer. And one of the priests uh, raised his hand, stood up and said, Your Excellency, with all due respect, I don't know if you realize how much times have changed since when you were a young priest. When you were a young priest, you know, there were three, four priests in, in every, uh, every rectory. But today, many of us are alone, one priest, big parish. So many more demands are made upon us. You, you really can't expect us to spend an extra half hour a day in prayer. It's just not realistic. <clears throat> the man sat down and the bishop nodded his head and he said, you know, I really hadn't thought about how times have changed, how much busier you all are now than when I was a young priest. So if you hope to accomplish all that you have to accomplish, half an hour a day extra prayer is not going to be enough. You're going to have to spend an extra hour every day in prayer. <clears throat> the author of the uh, Soul of the Apostolate, uh, Don Chartard, some of you may have, have read that, spiritual classic. Many of us, we hear the spiritual classics, but we never read the spiritual classics. <clears throat> anyway, he relates how he learned how important uh, prayer was, that is prayer first. So he lived in France uh, in the latter part of the 19th century, 1800s. And France was undergoing another religious persecution. And the monasteries were being closed down. <clears throat> so in this particular monastery, the, the abbot chose this, this young uh, monk who uh, was very intelligent, very well spoken, just very capable. And he sent him to Paris. And uh, he hoped that he would be able to do what was necessary in order to keep the monastery open. So the young monk, Don Chartard, eventually Don Chartard, uh, went, to, went to Paris and immediately started visiting the various government agencies and talking with people and filling out forms. And he spent several days all to no avail. Every door seemed to be closed. Uh, no one was, could give him any encouragement. <clears throat> so he's feeling very dejected and he's, he's walking along the streets of Paris and he passes a church and he, he thinks to himself, you know, I've been so busy these last several days, I haven't even had time to pray. So he, he walks into church and he spends a good long time there just in, in prayer. And he walks out and he feels much better than when he walked in. And as he's walking out, he meets this man, a man walks up to him, well-dressed man who expresses surprise to see a monk walking the streets of Paris. Usually they're in their monasteries. And so he explains, the man seemed very kindly, so he explained to the man why he was there. And it turned out that that particular man was a government official, high-placed government official, good Catholic, and he was able to pull the necessary strings in order to keep the monastery open. So a lesson that the young monk never forgot, that is, it's all about prayer, our relationship with the Lord. 
and allowing our Lord then to, to work in our lives and how often our Lord surprises us. It's kind of like the loaves and the fish. We have so little, but when we give it to our Lord, our Lord is able to multiply it and feed thousands and even have some left over. <clears throat> So we'll get to the habits. Um, so the first habit of holy apostolic people is the morning offering. So what is the morning offering? The morning offering is offering our day, so all of our, our thoughts, words, our actions, our joys, our sufferings to the Lord, uniting them with the Lord. It could be a, a prayer that we, we memorized, and many of us did when we, were, when we were young, or it could be a prayer that we make up. That's, that's the first uh, um, <clears throat> step first habit uh, for holy apostolic people, the morning offering. So that doesn't sound too, too difficult. What's difficult is what comes immediately before making the morning offering. And what comes immediately before making the morning offering? <laughs> getting up, getting out of bed. Yeah. <clears throat> so getting up on time is what is known as the heroic moment. <laughs> getting up on time. So if we get our day off to a good start, the chances are that our day is going to go, is going to go better. There's uh, what's called the grace of the moment. So every moment God is offering a grace. <clears throat> and if we're at the right place at the right time, as we should be, that grace is going to be available to us. How often we, we aren't, unfortunately. That heroic moment should also be lived when it's time to go to bed. Some people are too lazy to go to bed at the right time. It sounds like a contradiction, but no. So they, they needlessly stay up beyond their, their bedtime hour. <clears throat> and since they don't get to bed on time, they can't get up on time, or even if they do get up on time, they're very tired, and so they're sluggish throughout the whole day. <clears throat> a colleague of mine, a fellow priest, related how when he was growing up, his dad would, would wake him up and his brothers, <clears throat> and then his dad would, would go and get himself uh, ready for the day. And one of his brothers, would always slide himself ha halfway out of bed with his feet on the ground because the dad would always call out, are your feet on the ground? <laughs> and he could honestly say a bit deceptively, but yes, <laughs> yeah, his feet were on the ground, but his head was still on the bed. <clears throat> Saint, uh, so I already canonized him, uh, the late Father Benedict Rochelle <clears throat> uh, related how uh, he would not say his morning offering until about 10 minutes after he got up. And the reason why, because he said he couldn't think straight. He couldn't even remember his own name. <laughs> after about 10 minutes, things started to come, come into focus. But he was still getting up at the right time. <clears throat> so that, that's the first habit of holy apostolic people. The morning offering, but that heroic moment, getting up at the right time. The second habit is 15 minutes of silent prayer. Ideally, in the presence of the Blessed Eucharist. That's the ideal. However, we know that for many people, as much as they might like to do that, it's not possible for them to do that. So to find some place, some quiet place, some time, when they can spend those 15 minutes in silent prayer or mental prayer, if you will. <clears throat> St. Teresa of Avila, uh, no slouch when it came to, to prayer, uh, calls prayer a conversation, a conversation with the Lord. So there's this silent prayer. It's an opportunity to open up our hearts to the Lord, tell him what's on our mind, share our hopes, our desires. And at the same time, we'll want to know what's on our Lord's heart. What does he want to say to us? What does he desire of us? That's how we want to spend those, those 15 minutes. <clears throat> and who knows, maybe with time, you might even add to those 15 minutes. <clears throat> The saints would sometimes lose themselves in prayer. St. Joseph Le Bray, who lived in 19th century France, uh, but he traveled around a lot. Uh, he was what we would call today a street person. He just lived on the street. So he would spend most of his days in church. And even though he, he lived very poorly, he ate very little, he was capable of spending four, five, six hours on his knees in the most uncomfortable positions, and he would not move. He would not move. He was, he was so wrapped up, so caught up in prayer. St. Dominic Savio, 
uh, St. John Bosco's favorite pupil, died at the age of 15, I believe. On one occasion, St. Dominic, or St. John Bosco was looking for Dominic and couldn't find him and he asked the other boys <coughs> there in the school, numerous boys, if they had seen Dominic. No one had seen him. So St. John Bosco continued to look for him and finally he went into the chapel and there was uh, Dominic and uh, he was standing kind of near the communion rail and he had one foot in front of the other, so not a real comfortable kind of position and he was just gazing at the tabernacle. And so St. John Bosco walked up to him and he saw that he was he was just wrapped in ecstasy. And so St. John Bosco gently shook him and called his name and he kind of came to and he said, is the mass over already? It had ended several, several hours before. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that might not be you and me, <laughs> but uh, can we spend 15 minutes, 15 minutes a day with our Lord in prayer? The third habit so we got the morning offering, 15 minutes uh, in prayer. It's 15 minutes of spiritual reading. It doesn't have to be done all at one time. You could do five minutes uh, at one time of the day, five minutes at another, and five minutes at the end of the day if you wish. <clears throat> Hopefully, at least a few of those minutes would be spent reading sacred scripture. After all, sacred scripture is the book that God wrote. So uh, good to read that book. But it's not the only book that uh, we, we need read when it comes to spiritual reading. Lots of good spiritual books, uh, Lies of the Saints, uh, so fill our minds with good thoughts. Uh, we get a lot of inspiration, a lot of motivation from uh, these, these books. And we find out that the, the saints, they were people just like you and me. Uh, they had similar trials. They sometimes failed, but they never gave up. And ultimately, they, they were successful, and so can we. <clears throat> At times, I'll have to admit that I found it difficult to, to find that time, even 15 minutes during the day, to set aside for, for reading. <clears throat> and so at one point, I began to, to read a, at nighttime, just before I would go to bed. In fact, normally, I would be in bed. And uh, I would read for just a few minutes. <clears throat> and it's amazing how much you can read if, uh, if you're consistent. That is, you, you do it every day. So I read through most of the works of St. John of the Cross. Uh, I read the Diary of St. Faustina. Anyone here read the whole Diary of St. Faustina? It's one of my claims to fame. I don't know too many people have read the whole Diary of St. Faustina. I read the whole diary, and I did it in bed. Yeah, just a couple pages at a, at a time. So if, if you had a 200-page book, you read two pages a day, that means you would finish that book in 100 days, which means you could easily finish three 200-page books in a year. So not so very uh, difficult, again, if we, uh, we make it a priority in our lives. So a morning offering, 15 minutes of silent prayer, 15 minutes of spiritual reading. The fourth habit is the most important one of all, Holy Mass and Holy Communion, <clears throat> which is, is the center of every true spiritual life. If, if someone doesn't have the Eucharist as a center of his spiritual life, well, then you can forget about his spiritual life. <clears throat> Not everyone, of course, can go to Mass every day. There's many people who would love to go to Mass every day, but their duties or obligations uh, demand other of them, and they're not, not, not able to. If they take advantage of the Mass, they go to Mass, when they can go to Mass, then they're not going to suffer spiritually. They'll continue to grow spiritually. <clears throat> but there are many more people, many more Catholics, they could go to Mass every day, or much more often, and they simply don't do it. And the reason why is because they don't appreciate the Mass. They don't appreciate the Eucharist as it should be appreciated. And for that reason, again, their, their spiritual life is always going to be stunted. When we, we go to Mass, uh, we, we know from studying our catechism that uh, Calvary is being repre represented. So every time you go to Mass, uh, mystically, you're standing on Calvary again. What an incredible thing. Wow, Calvary, standing with Our Lady St. John, <clears throat> our Lord hanging on the cross. And all the graces that our Lord won for us on Calvary are distributed at the Mass. So if the Mass came to an end, if there were no more Masses, no more grace. That would be the end of grace, the end of the world. But uh, I don't think we need fear uh, since uh, 
our Lord is with us until the end of time. <clears throat> so the Mass will continue. But those who participate in the Mass are the ones who are going to most especially benefit from the many graces that, again, our Lord won for us once and for all on Calvary, but now he's, he's, he's giving to us at that particular moment. <clears throat> and then the Eucharist, of course, it's our Lord himself, body and blood. Talk about intimacy. You can't get any more intimate with our Lord than by receiving him in Holy Communion. And no be better time to talk with our Lord than uh, when you receive him in Holy Communion. Hopefully we, we, we all do that. Uh, we can tell our Lord anything. So I remember a <clears throat> First Communion student and uh, she made her First Communion. She's walking home with her mother and her mother was kind of curious and said, uh, what, did you, what did you say to Jesus after Communion? She said, well, I told him that I loved him. And then I, I prayed for you and dad and a brother and sister. And then I told him a ghost story. Um, yeah, it was probably the best story our Lord heard that day. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not so much that we, we have to say uh, flowery things to, to our Lord. Uh, what, what our Lord really wants, what he really wants is us. That, that, that's what he wants, that we would spend that time with him. <clears throat> Every communion worthily received will merit a greater degree of glory in heaven. Every time you receive Holy Communion, your glory is, greater, is going to be greater in heaven. Your happiness is going to be greater in heaven. We were talking a little bit here at, at dinner uh, about that, uh, that very point. Everyone in heaven will be as happy as he can be, so you don't have to worry about that. But uh, uh, depending upon the degree of love that you achieved in this life, uh, you'll be able to receive more happiness. You'll have an intimacy with God that uh, some will not have. Father Walter Chiswick, uh, one of my heroes, uh, he was sentenced to uh, 15 years of hard labor in Siberia. I've of often thought that if uh, I was in his position, I would have just curled up and died. So uh, after spending uh, three years in solitary confinement, uh, constant interrogations, so now he's sent to Siberia. And uh, his very first day uh, there, so they put him to work in the hold of a ship shoveling coal. So for 12 hours, uh, almost nonstop, he's, he's shoveling coal in the hold of the ship. And he has to work as, as fast as he possibly can, even though he's, he's extremely weak, three years in solitary confinement. Uh, you can imagine uh, the food wasn't like what we'd eaten this evening and uh, hasn't been able to use his muscles exercise. But one of the reasons why he had to work so furiously is because, you know, the coal keeps coming down. And if he didn't keep uh, shoveling it, he would be buried, literally buried alive. So he's, he's working just to save his life. He wakes up the next morning. He can't move a muscle. Every muscle in his body is, is, is tight. And just the least movement caused him just the greatest agony he still had to get up and do the same thing he'd done the day before. So the next time you want to complain about how hard life is, <laughs> think about uh, Father Walter Chiswick, about his, his life. So it was possible at times uh, for people to uh, uh, somehow uh, sneak uh, the, the hosts and, and the wine uh, into the prison camp, and so he was able to celebrate Mass uh, sometimes. Of course, he had to be very careful about how he did that. And he would do it early in the morning before anyone else uh, got up. <clears throat> and then he would, he would keep the, the hosts on him. And uh, the men then who wanted to receive communion, however they would make that known to them, somehow during the day he would try to get close to them and, and be able to give them communion. So some of the men would wait all day uh, with just the hope of receiving communion because sometimes something would happen and he wasn't able to bring them communion. <clears throat> and of course at that time in order to receive Holy Communion you had to fast from midnight you couldn't even drink water if you wanted to receive communion these men were living on star a starvation diet forced to, to work extremely hard and yet they were willing to give up that little bit of food that they needed to survive just with the hope that they might be able to receive Holy Communion just imagine if every Catholic 
had that desire to receive Holy Communion, our world would be incredibly different uh, today. <clears throat> Fortunately, uh, it isn't so very difficult uh, uh, for us, but hopefully we never have to learn the hard way uh, to be without the Eucharist. <clears throat> Uh, the fifth habit of holy apostolic people is the Angelus or the Regina Celi during the Easter season. This is Easter season, so we, uh, we pray or sing the Regina Celi. <clears throat> it's to be prayed every day at noon. So traditionally, uh, the Angelus was prayed three times a day, 6 a.m., 12 noon, and then 6 p.m. But um, Father McCluskey tells us uh, that uh, just doing it once a day at noon would be sufficient. And part of the reason is because it helps us just to refocus um, our, our attention on the Lord. Even if we start the day off right, but uh, by the time we get to the middle of the day, most of us are kind of caught up with the day-to-day -day affairs, uh, our preoccupations, uh, our work, whatever it may be. And so we, we kind of forget about the Lord. This gives us an opportunity to remember him. If you have a smartphone, you might just set you know, 12 noon, it'll ring. So it'll remind you, oh, I have to, have to pray the, the Angelus. One of my most memorable experiences in the uh, Philippines was in the supermarkets. So if you were in the supermarket, at least where I was, that part of the Philippines where I was, if you were in the supermarkets at 12 noon, the loudspeaker would come on and the Angelus was uh, prayed. And everybody stopped. I mean, if you wanted to check out, uh, the checker outers would, uh, would not check you out until the Angelus was done. Everybody would stop. Even Muslims would stop. <clears throat> and if there were any atheists there, they would stop. Everybody stopped. And uh, hopefully prayed along the, the, the Angelus. <clears throat> St. John Bosco, another one of my, my heroes, <clears throat> some of you, uh, hopefully most are familiar, somewhat with the life of St. John Bosco. So he had many, what he called dreams. Others might call apparitions. Uh, but he had numerous dreams uh, throughout, throughout his life. Uh, so when he was young, maybe about five years old, he had his first dream. And in this dream, our Lord appeared to him, and he didn't recognize our Lord. That is, he didn't know who our, our Lord was. <clears throat> and uh, he even said to him in his dream, my mom told me not to talk to strangers. <clears throat> our Lord said to him, I will give you a teacher under whose guidance you will learn, and without whose help all knowledge becomes foolishness. So our Lord was referring actually to his blessed mother. He was going to give our blessed mother to St. John to uh, guide him throughout his life. And then St. John asks this man, but who are you? And our Lord describes himself in this way. I am the son of the woman your mother has taught you to greet three times a day. I am the son of the woman your mother has taught you to greet three times a day. Our Lord was referring to the Angelus. Uh, so it must be a prayer that's extremely pleasing to our Lord and to our Blessed Mother if our Lord would describe himself in that particular way. <clears throat> the sixth habit, it's another Marian habit, it's the praying of the rosary. Uh, the saints tell us that if we, uh, we want to take a shortcut, uh, get to our Lord as quickly as possible, uh, no better way to do it than by means of our Blessed Mother, through the heart of Mary. <clears throat> when we, we pray the rosary, hopefully we meditate upon the mysteries, our, our Lord's life and the life of our Blessed Mother become almost as familiar to us as our own life, maybe even more, more familiar because we forget a lot of things, but we're constantly meditating those important events in the life of Our Lady, uh, our, our Lord, and you just can't forget them. And, and hopefully, again, illuminated by the Holy Ghost, uh, we often get uh, some little, little insights, things that we hadn't thought about before. <clears throat> we can compare our lives with the way that our Lord and our Blessed Mother compared, uh, lived their lives. Sister Lucia, one of the three seers of Fatima, uh, addressed the difficulty that many people have in keeping their, their minds uh, fixed when they're praying the rosary. Maybe no one here has any difficulty when they, they, they pray, pray the rosary, but I must admit, I do. My mind just uh, wanders off uh, very easily. So is it worthwhile? Should we continue to pray? And Sister Lucia said yes. She said just, just the fact that you pick up the rosary, you want to pray, you love our Blessed Mother, 
And you're trying to pray, even though it's, it may seem that most of the time your, your mind is, is somewhere else. She said that will still be advantageous to you. Mm-hmm. Our, our, our Blessed Mother understands. And oftentimes, uh, simply by doing that, making that extra effort, uh, it, it brings, brings peace to our hearts, uh, to, to our minds, to our families. When uh, Blessed Mother Teresa uh, wasn't praying the rosary, she was holding the rosary. And uh, if she wasn't doing something else or something else wasn't being demanded of her, she was praying the rosary. She, I don't know how many rosaries she prayed a day, but constantly praying the rosary, or at least holding it. And someone asked her, Mother, why do you always hold the rosary? And she said, because when I hold the rosary, I'm holding on to the hand of our Blessed Mother. So I think that's another good reason why we should continue to pray, pray the rosary, even if we, we have all of those difficulties with distractions, because just the fact that you're holding the rosary, you're holding on to the hand of our Blessed Mother. It's kind of like a little child, so he's holding on to the hand of his mother. He might not even be thinking about his mother. He's skipping along and he's talking to himself, as little kids do. But still, he knows he's holding on to the hand of his mother. That's what gives him, gives him uh, uh, security. <clears throat> And so too, hopefully, for you and me. So uh, don't give up on praying the rosary. The seventh and final habit <clears throat> is the examination of conscience, brief examination of con- conscience. So Socrates said that the unexamined life is not worth living. And when we examine our conscience, it gives us the opportunity to do exactly that, examine our lives. Of all the the habits mentioned so far, this one is probably the most neglected. And yet for the saints, they considered it the most important. Saint Ignatius of Loyola would more easily dispense his subjects from their daily meditation than he would from their examination of conscience. It should be a short prayer period, usually done at the end of the day, although you could do it some other time during the day as well, in which we, we ask for light to see ourselves as God sees us, We review our day, our thoughts, our words, our actions. We see when we may have failed in some way. We sinned. We ask pardon for our failures. And then we we make a firm resolution to try to do better tomorrow. One of the reasons why we often don't change, we we continue to commit the same same sins, fall into the same errors, is because we, we never seriously make a resolution to change. And sometimes that's sufficient, again, with the help of God's grace. What, what, what can I concretely do to overcome myself? <clears throat> and one area to review is how well we're fulfilling the seven daily habits. Is it really impossible to find the time? How much time do we spend browsing the internet, reading the news, watching YouTube videos, checking on our email, and in so many other ways, just frittering time away? We could have prayed an extra rosary. We could have spent some more time in spiritual reading. These habits, if they're lived well, are going to help us to to live or to obey the second part of the Great Commandment. So the first part of the Great Commandment is to love God above all things. And the second part is to love our neighbor as ourself. And the only way we can love our neighbor as ourself is if we love God first and foremost above all things. So, So no one is holy just for himself. It's impossible to become a saint just for yourself. Okay, it's just me. It's all about me and God. And I'm just going to be holy for me. And everyone else can take care of himself. It's impossible. There are no such saints like that. So if we're going to be saints, it means then that we're going to be channels of grace for others. So the holier a priest becomes, the holier his parishioners are going to become. The curia of ours completely transformed his parish. So when he arrived in ours, most people weren't even going to Mass, uh, leading hedonistic lives. And yet, after a few years there, almost to a man, they became fervent, almost to a man. The holier parents become, the better channels of grace they become for their children as well. So St. Monica was a holy woman. She obtained the conversion of her son, Augustine, No Monica, no Augustine. Of course, on the other hand, no Augustine, probably no Monica, no Saint Monica. That is, God used Augustine in order to motivate Monica to pray more, sacrifice more, 
so that not only would Augustine be saved, but so that she would become a saint. And it's the same for you and me. God allows these difficulties in our lives, hopefully to motivate us, so that uh, not only will we become holier, but we'll obtain graces needed by others. Uh, Louis and Zelie Martin were a holy couple. In fact, they were canonized, was it last year or the year before? Last year. Uh, last, year. last year. They raised a family of saints. Uh, one of their daughters, St. Therese, some consider the greatest saint of modern times, doctor of the church. Another one of their daughters, uh, her cause for canonization is being promoted now, Leone, who was considered uh, the least of, of the bunch, if you will, <clears throat> the least promising. <clears throat> And none of them were slouches when it came to uh, living holy lives. So if we, we live well these seven daily habits, uh, they'll, have that, they'll make us holy, they'll make us apostolic. Morning offering, the heroic moment, 15 minutes of silent prayer, 15 minutes of spiritual reading, holy mass and communion, always when possible, angelus, rosary, examination of conscience. And that's it. You got it all. Yeah.